commitment. You. To the course coordinators, lecturers, tutors, and guest lecturers, thank you for your commitment, professionalism, and efforts to be able to be here today, celebrating the completion of courses. Resilience this academic year can be your trademark. An extra sign of appreciation goes to the instructors who were affected by the cyber attack. And by saying this, I'm sure that Bruno and students are remembering that day at 6 p.m. when the system collapsed and you had six more hours to submit your final submission for your public policy analysis written assignment. Also, an extra sign of appreciation goes to the instruct instructors that transition to distance education without much notice. For some, it was three days. For others, three days and two weeks. And for the lucky group, it was three days, two weeks, and one month. We owe you this invaluable experience of being able to continue learning. Our gratitude continues. And I now thank the governance of the MPP for working towards ensuring transparency and accountability mechanisms and for your commitment to improve this program. The Board of Examiners, with Dr. Michaela Banore as chair, that took a key role during this transition period to distance education. Resilience at full speed. The Education Program Committee led by Professor Francisca Gassman, that contributes to the development of the curriculum. A special thank you goes today to Francisca, whom I consider the mother of the MPP, who is stepping down from being a chair after three years and being a member of the Education Program Committee for nine years. So thanks, Francisca, for all your work. Another important element of the governments of the MPP is our study association demos with Marjorie Fontentil as president. Our gratitude goes for all the good work you have done for the cohort and for the program. You have shown to be an inclusive representative body and achieved many important goals, such as the creation of the alumni committee, the trip to Geneva, and the many social events organized for after the exams. Now our gratitude goes to our students, what we call the MPP years. You showed a great capacity to adjust and to contribute to the success of the program. You showed commitment and cooperation. You made it worthy. This year has given you an invaluable experience that will shape you as individuals and as future policy actors. Finally, I invite all of us that are here today in this Zoom chat to also thank our loved ones who are now joining via the YouTube channel. Whoever they are and wherever they may be, parents, partners, siblings, kids, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, thank you for accompanying and giving strength to move on in this spirit of uncertainty. You helped us adapt. It might not have been easy, but your support most probably has been the foundation for all of us to be here today. With this note of appreciation and adaptation, I give the floor now to Marjorie Fontenley, president of the St Study Association Demos. Well, thank you, Julieta. And um, to be fully honest with you, uh, it was quite hard for me um, to prepare for this pitch. I wrote several drafts, uh, but none of them were satisfying enough. I tortured myself trying to figure out how to properly conclude this crazy year. And suddenly I thought about my beloved grandma and what she used to say. And she used to always challenge me with deep reflection on about the journey of life. 
and she used to love to reflect on everything and I'm pretty sure she would have given a hard time to Rousseau or Kant. And she used to say that uh, life is just a succession of lessons, good or bad, but lessons that we have to learn in order to become better and accomplish yourself. It's very cheesy and cliche, I agree, but nevertheless, it's true. And I started to reflect uh, on what lessons I learned from this, years, this year and furthermore, what lesson we all learned this year. And first thought that popped up in my mind, ironically, uh, was the time management and the respect of deadlines. Something that may sound easy and obvious, but in some way, you and you managed to make it particularly hard and challenging sometimes, probably responsible for several mental breakdown among students. But more seriously, the most important lesson I think we all learn concerns diversity. And in these particular circumstances of a, facial, uh, of a racial pandemic, where all our societal values are questioned, and when it is time to rebuild, rebuild a better society, the respect of diversity is the key. I'm not saying something new. Diversity and inclusion is the motto of our university and of the UN. But what does it actually mean? The respect of diversity in theory diverges from the practice. Beside the fact that we are all open-minded and sensitive to interculturalism, which are the reason why we choose and have been chosen for this program, we have experienced the true challenge of diversity. And we should all be thankful for this opportunity we had to learn from each other and learn how to cope with our multiculturalism or age difference or background difference or religion difference. We might not have always been on the same page, but in the end, we learn how to accept, understand, and tolerate each other's perspective. And this, is not, and this is the most valuable lesson from this year. And if there is one thing I will remember from our court is how we always helped each other despite our differences. It was not in spite of, but because of our differences that made our time here particularly successful. After this year, we definitely all developed strong intercultural communication skills. And it might be one of the most important skills for future lives and career. Most of us are highly ambitious and determined to create a better future. But it starts with the incredible lesson learned on diversity. Take this lesson you learn and strive to be the different because we are the change. I think this speech is also a moment for me to thank you, to say thank you to my fellow students and friends now for this incredible year, for all your support. And those of us who feel anxious about the work we still need to do, I would like to remind you, as my grandmother would have told me, that good things don't come easy. And after all this hard work, we can be proud of ourselves. As one door closes, another opens. At the same time, I would like to wish a happy birthday to Shai Mesadan. I hope you will spend a good day. I want to thank Demos team uh, and the communication committee for the work and the support. Um, teamwork is the key, is definitely the key, and we will have never been able to do all these things without it. On the behalf of the student, I would like to thank our beloved professors, the student office team, the student advisor, and of course, our program director, Julieta, for this incredible job you all did and how quickly you managed to adapt in these challenging times and providing us with a good quality study environment. We are lucky that so much effort were put together for us. I will miss the small notes uh, with word of encouragement in the weeks approaching the deadlines. I will also miss the coffee machine that turned me into an addict. Don't get me wrong, you and you, uh, it wasn't the greatest coffee, uh, but it certainly instigated heated debates on the top of the queue. After August, we will all take our own path, uh, but I am convinced that we will still remain connected. And I truly count on you to maintain this connection, not only to maintain our friendship, but who knows, we may end up colleague. Demos worked hard to implement an alumni committee to make this connection possible. I know that most of us are sad that we cannot properly say goodbye to each other, that we have to, to stay online. Uh, but I assure you, once we will all be alumni and 
cross finger for graduate on time. I will do all my best to organize the ceremony we deserve once the sanitary condition allows us, of course. I think one of the proof that the MPP spirit does not die is that today three alumni take the time to attend our online ceremony. Andy Shabisu, Melissa Charwe, and David Lambert, Tum Wizige. Please accept my apologies for my bad pronunciation. I would like to thank them for joining us and also have the chance, we have the chance that one of them prepares a speech for us. David Lambert was a student in one of the first cohort of MPPs. He is now a policy and advocacy advisor at Expanding Social Protection Program in Uganda. And I will leave him the floor and I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much, Marjorie. And it's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, let me introduce myself again. I'm David Lambert to Messenger. I'm an advisor to the government of Uganda's expanding social protection program, uh, where I've worked over the past 10 years with colleagues in government, civil society, and development partners to help develop political support for social protection in Uganda. As Marjorie mentioned, uh, in September 20, 2001, I enrolled in the Master of Science in Social Protection Financing. Uh, I definitely couldn't have afforded it, but I received a scholarship from the program and my employer on condition that I would come back to Uganda and put these skills uh, to practice. Um, I think that around that time, you know, a lot of people did not know about social protection, uh, but a lot has changed since then. And so I really want to start by acknowledging how grateful I am and honored to represent the number of alumnus that have gone through this important program that are helping to promote social protection worldwide. Um, over the last several years, over the past several years, I have been deeply involved in writing speeches and and uh, notes for political leaders in Uganda. Uh, sorry, no, if there was a blip, our power, I think, just left. It started raining as I started my speech, but do not worry. Uh, and so, although I've been writing speeches, I really don't think that I have the confidence to totally ignore the use of PowerPoint. So I would like to beg your indulgence so I can share some slides with you. Uh, just to guide my presentation today. Right, so uh, I was actually one of the first uh, uh, cohort of students among 14, 14 students from different parts of the world. Um, it's been a very long time, so you can actually see how much change has taken place in the way I look. I was a very young boy then, I'm now an old man. Um, and in fact, at that time, not many people actually understood what social protection was. Um, this didn't change until a decade later. And so I'm really happy that today social protection is one of the targets uh, for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And in fact, the ILO, the UNU Merit and Maastricht University have really been critical to this uh, transformation. In fact, one of our teachers, Michael Sishon, has been promoting this idea for a very long time. Um, and I know I was really, really elated when the ILO General Assembly adopted the recommendation on social protection clause in 2012. And this program has really had a very strong influence on me um, because I have a very deep appreciation of uh, poverty and inequality and how these issues are uh, inhibit social economic progress and uh,
deny so many people chances to be so over the years i've also what social protection can be on human capital fostering inclusive development so I'm, I'm therefore quite frustrated and share this frustration with so many people in the development industry who cannot appreciate the lack of political will to improve investments in social protection uh, globally. So I'm really grateful to the wonderful faculty that walked all this wonderful team through the program at a time when nobody knew about social protection. It was quite intense but it actually prepared us for the typical routine of um, the people who work in this industry. We work under a lot of pressure. Our first day with the guy on the left started with the ride through the rain. He was my roommate, Usman. Uh, and of course the perspective warned us about uh, they're required to pick 10 kilograms of reading materials at the copy shop every Friday. Um, but we actually had great fun. Uh, we made a lot of good friends. I took off the time to nurture my passion in music and soon became the official DJ at one of our parties uh, in the basement, as you can see there. Um, did I learn something serious? Yes, I did. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, of things. Um, I acquired valuable skills, uh, but actually I also wanted to take this time to thank so many people that helped us to, to, to become who we become. Uh, in particular, I'd like to take this moment to ask you to observe a short moment of silence for uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Scholz, who was one of our social budgeting uh, teachers. He used to work at the ILO. He died if few days ago, just shy of his 70th birthday. May his soul rest in peace. So did I learn anything very serious on this program? Yes, thanks to people like Scholz and I, I learned a lot. I acquired a lot of quantitative skills, as you can see on my certificate in policy analysis and certification financing building on all those courses in economics, socioeconomic statistics, social budgeting, healthcare financing. And these skills have enabled me to make sense of the very complex issues and analysis, but also importantly to simplify them for the non-technical policy makers who actually ultimately have to make the decision. Uh, Professor Francisca's lessons in poverty and vulnerability analysis have been particularly helpful. Um, in all my work coordinating analytical studies in Uganda, but also in Ghana. Uh, but also I actually learned one of the biggest lessons in teamwork and accountability on this course, because on one of the weekends, uh, I refused to lead preparation for our starter training homework. And during the week, Basically, we didn't do anything at the weekend. And during the week, um, our teacher, Professor Denis de Crombrew, did not hesitate to award us zero marks uh, for the assignment that we did not do. Uh, and so you can imagine how much we struggled uh, with this course. So we certainly do not have a lot of time to share all my wonderful work experiences today, but I would like to share a few notable uh, experiences that can help to illuminate how a typical uh, career in development might look like. Uh, so I actually did not return to NSSF until January 20, 2004, because Michael, uh, one of our teachers, in fact, took a gamble on my new skills and sent me to Ghana to support uh, the ILO's Global Social Trust Project. And so between 2012 and 20, 2002 and 2003, sorry, I supported the design of this project, which was aiming at subsidizing health insurance premium for poor women, uh, particularly pregnant uh, mothers of, uh, and mothers of children under five uh, in one of the districts in Ghana. At the same time, I coordinated the ILO's technical support to, 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 to develop the national health insurance scheme. 
Uh, in fact, during the inception phase, uh, Michael invited me to my one of my first ever meetings with the Minister of Finance. It was a very tough meeting, but also I got to draft uh, my first speech, um, my first political speech. It was for the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, who was supposed to officially launch our, our project in Ghana. And these meetings were really very good initiation for the work that actually eventually have, have, to be, have had to become my normal routine. I, you know, every two months, I really have to brief a politician about social protection. And I've been doing this since my time in Ghana. I also got to appreciate uh, the political economy of social protection and that political economy is quite as important as the technical design of programs. Uh, for instance, I know that on the eve of an election in 2004, uh, the government of Ghana, the ruling government, was keen to implement a national health insurance scheme. And they really were not willing to listen to any advice about the challenges that they had not had the time to address. And so they actually went ahead and launched the program, including establishing a health insurance levy to subsidize uh, people who could not afford to pay premiums for the scheme. But three years later into the scheme, they actually couldn't spend this money uh, because they had not done adequate preparation, despite the fact that I actually, I and several colleagues told them that they needed to prepare. And so they were struggling to identify who these people are. Uh, now the flip side is that 10 years later, when I joined the Expanding Social Protection Program, I had the opposite experience. And we've spent a lot of time trying to build political support by convincing our political leaders and senior technical officers about the efficacy of investing in social protection in Uganda. And therefore, the lesson I want you to have as fresh students um, of uh, social policy and development is that you really need to learn to work politically. In fact, next week, I will be delivering a presentation on how in Uganda we have uh, worked to build political leadership for social protection at the UK Development Studies Association Conference on New Leadership for Global Challenges. So you may want to join this conference if you want to hear more about this story. Uh, but as I said, um, you know, I didn't come back to Uganda immediately. I did come back in 2004, but in 2007, I actually went back to Ghana to help the ILO redesign their original health, health insurance um, premium project, the Ghana Social Trust, which is on this screen. And by coincidence, the government of Ghana was actually designing its livelihood empowerment program. You can see their logo at the bottom of the screen. And as part of the ILO's uh, a program design, we needed to ensure that our project was aligned to the government um, plans. And so I actually found myself embedded with the design team. And this was really a turning point in my career because I got to learn a lot about cash fund transfer programs, which were very, a very new idea at the time. I also got to meet and read about some of the greatest names in social protection, like Michael Samson, and Stephen Kidd, who actually three years later in 2010, introduced me to the Ugandan social protection team. And for the last 10 years, I've actually been working there. As you saw in the pictures, I've actually built a lot of wonderful relationships with colleagues, both in Maastricht, in Ghana, and in across the international development community, wherever I've worked. Um, with my former classmates in Ghana, Tio and Ben and others, we actually helped to address the government of Ghana's challenges in management of their new health insurance scheme. Uh, we were adapting the ILO's uh, social budgeting tools for health insurance and other tools and training senior government officials in the Ministry of Health and the National Health Insurance Fund to address the challenges they were facing and to plan better for an effective implementation of the social uh, the social health insurance scheme. And all these relationships that I've cultivated over the years have really continued to support me and inspire me in my current role as a social protection specialist. Therefore, I challenge you to avail yourself to some good people because not only will you find inspiration in these people, but you'll also benefit from their great wisdom and experience. 
as well as influence. Um, when I returned to Ghana in 2004, I was actually reinstated in my position as a research officer. And then I got to put to test my newly acquired data management skills, you know, from my classes with Franziska and others. And so I was using Stata around that time to query the National Social Security Fund's databases and to track a range of performance measures and generate very useful insights for the managers to improve compliance and business process efficiency at the National Social Security Fund. And actually very soon after that, I was championing the NSSF's organizational customer service improvements and setting high performance targets in the collection of contributions and timely payment of benefits. Um, in June, uh, in 2008, when I returned from Ghana, I was appointed performance intelligence manager and actually helped to lead an organization-wide initiative to develop and track progress and implementation of its 10-year uh, turnaround and transformation strategy. And as you'll see in this slide, we improved benefit payment turnaround times from 105 days. This is processing a simple benefit, 105 days in 2009 and 10 at the time when I left to 10 days in 2013. Actually, the last I heard recently from their managing director, I think they are paying in less than a week. So the skills I got from uh, this course and you know, the governance guidelines we learned about from our colleagues from the ILO were really, really um, important in helping me to put my skills to work, but also to actually influence transformation or change at the National Social Security Fund. Now, I mentioned earlier that in Ghana, I met a lot of people, a lot of influential people, and one of them was Stephen Kidd and Michael Samson. In June 2010, they actually convinced me to join uh, the Expanding Social Protection Program. And this was a very ambitious program in Uganda. It was seeking to embed a national social protection system within Uganda's development planning and budgeting process. And we're starting from a very, very low base of little or no support for social protection and a lot of skepticism, ignorance, but also total ideological opposition to social protection among policymakers. And in the first two years of the project, I actually worked as a project economist and coordinated a lot of analytical work. So I got to put my quantitative skills uh, especially in policy, uh, policy analysis to uh, support the development of analytical work, which was required to inform the development of Uganda's social protection policy and making sense of all the other evidence that we needed to generate to influence policymakers and enhance commitment to social protection. Uh, but in 2013, uh, I was actually reassigned the role of coordinating the program's advocacy and influencing initiatives, and I worked with researchers and civil society to deepen knowledge of the impact of social protection and feasibility of expanding social protection in Uganda. In fact, as you'll see, one of those, that's one of the uh, cover slides for the conference with uh, Franz, Professor Franziska in 2007, uh, to build the economic case for investing in social protection in Uganda. And so we've been really working with several colleagues to build the economic case for social protection. On the right, there is a study we conducted with uh, Michael Samson and UNICEF, again, on the same subject, building a strong case for social protection in Uganda. And a key part of my influencing work actually involved direct lobbying of high level policymakers. And so I participated in a lot of global and local evidence uh, policy framing discussions and building coalitions with civil society and to build grassroots demand and build political support for social protection. I was also deeply involved in the planning and coordinating of international exchange visits and local study tours to basically expose these policymakers to the economic impacts and the evidence there is uh, of social protection, as well as the financing uh, options and political economy of social protection in countries as varied as Brazil, South Africa, and Mauritius. 
Uh, also, one of the key components of this Spanish social protection program was the social assistance grants for empowerment, which was a pilot scheme designed to attest the administrative feasibility of social protection, in particular cash transfers in Uganda, uh, and to generate the local impacts uh, of uh, evidence, sorry, local evidence of impact, so that we can use it as a, a reference point for influence, influencing policy. So through such field visits and sharing of the program's impact, we actually exposed a lot of political maker, political policy makers, sorry, uh, civil society and the media on the strategic importance of social protection. As a result, social protection is actually quite a prominent uh, feature of the public and the political discussions in Uganda. We've convinced several uh, influential politicians to champion social protection and building on that, we've turned our attention to developing costing and financing uh, plans for expanding social protection. In fact, in 2015, the government of Uganda decided to roll out the SAGE uh, pilot from 15 districts to 55 this year. But actually due to overwhelming political support, um, the government overwhelmingly voted in parliament to expand the program to all the 135 districts within Uganda. And so in March this year, just before the lockdown, the president launched the program in all uh, districts nationally. And this actually means that a lot of government financing has been uh, allocated to financing social security in Uganda. Now, over the last two years, I've been coordinating the development of a long-term vision for social protection in Uganda up to 2030. And so this um, uh, image shows our vision for a multi-tiered social security system for the different uh, side, stages of the life cycle. As part of this work, I've actually been facilitating a lot of policy dialogue and coordinating social protection training for staff of the National Planning Authority and the Minister of Finance, including overseeing uh, a very important study to simulate the macro level impact of social protection based on the proposals that are part of this vision. Uh, and so we've really made a lot of progress in terms of the technical influencing process. Uh, but you also may be curious to know, you know, how have we, how have all this work translated in, um, you know, the government of Uganda appreciating the importance of social protect protection um, during COVID. I don't think there's been so much commitment because social protection coverage is still very low in Uganda and also fiscal space remains low. Uh, in fact, over the last two months, I've been working and coordinating the dialogue between the donors and the government of Uganda to show how social protection can be a part of the response against COVID-19. We've suggested several options, but actually we've not received a lot worried about raising expectations and they do not want to commit to paying um, uh, so many people when fiscal space is dwindling. And yet our target is actually to increase uh, social protection spending from 0.06% today to 1.5% of GDP on direct income support alone. And so these are the sort of challenges that you actually will have to face as you embark on your work in the development industry and you will need a lot of good luck. So these are some of the options that I talked about. You know, we propose to roll out the senior citizens grant from current coverage of about 300,000 to 1.1 million people to cover labor-constrained households, informal sector workers, and children under two, but these actually have not been possible. Therefore, I would like to congratulate all of you, the class of 2020. You've completed studies from a very prestigious institution, but I can guarantee you that you've been prepared for a very brilliant future across the international development industry worldwide, and therefore, you should thump your chest I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David, and thank you, Marjorie, for talking before. It's, it was very nice to see your, not only how you explained about the, the history of the MPP and also your own history and how 
uh, this has been touched by the experience that you had in the MPP. And I'm sure that most of the students, when you showed the, the diploma, were wondering uh, how much it has changed. Now we already have two logos. We have United Nations University beside Maastricht University. And uh, we have a variety of courses and specializations. So this is a, a, a good sign that, that we are growing and that we are becoming more inclusive and also the number of students. So thanks for that. It, it, was, it was really enjoyable. And I hope that all the, the MPPers uh, will be joining this alumni group uh, in the next couple of months after uh, finishing with their thesis. And I hope that we remain in touch, David. Thanks for that. Now we will enjoy the musical contribution of our MPP fellow Esmara Gazvik that she, has, she was playing already before um, while we were entering into the, into the ceremony. Please use this moment to stretch a little bit, get more comfortable. And I know that this is one of the advantages of the online events. I'm sure that now you are sitting in, the, in your favorite sofa or you are enjoying uh, the view outside, uh, talking to a plant or whatever you like doing. So, but yeah, get more relaxed, um, enjoy the music and we will resume in five minutes with our keynote speaker of this afternoon, Director Bart Verspachen. Thank you, Esmara. I now introduce our keynote speaker, Director Bart Vespachen. 
Bart served as director of UNU Merit and director dean of the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance for the last eight years, and he's finished his term in September 2020. He's an economist specialized in the economics of technological change. Before giving him the floor, I hereby thank him for his support and contribution to the program during these years. It is not a goodbye since you will be around, but rather a thank you for all these years of service. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Julieta. Um, before I actually start my uh, address to the audience and to the students in particular, I would like to take a moment to, uh, to thank two people. Uh, we've already had a lot of thank yous in this exceptional uh, ceremony and in this exceptional closing of the, uh, of the academic year for the program. But I'd like to add uh, just two more. And uh, the first one that I would like to add is one that, um, uh, that is actually addressed at, uh, at Julieta. Sorry. Sorry, there was a phone ringing here. These things can happen. Uh, so first, I would actually like to thank Julieta because she, as a program director to the MPP, has been just wonderful, not uh, only during this last semester of this current academic year, but in general. Uh, she stepped uh, in when it was actually a very hard job to follow, but she's done very well. And especially in this last half year, she has been doing just wonderful. And it was not easy for her. It was not easy for anybody in the program, not for the teachers, not for the students, but certainly not for the program director. And I want to, uh, uh, to thank her for the effort that she put in. And I want to congratulate her on the way that she did this because this was truly exceptional. Um, so you can give her an applause later on, but I also want to thank briefly uh, Thomas Siesemer. Thomas is one of the teachers in the MPP program and he's been a close colleague of mine for a large number of years now. And he actually very recently retired very soon after the, uh, the crisis hit, very soon after the lockdown started, Thomas retired. I don't think one thing led to another. It was planned for a while. Uh, and we have never really been able to, to say goodbye to him in a proper way. Uh, and that holds also for the MPP. So I briefly want to mention him here as well. He's been teaching to uh, generations of students uh, in the program, and he has also been doing a great job. So I also want to thank him for, uh, for that. And I, I hope that somehow he will be attending this ceremony. Now, um, with those two things, um, let me actually start my, uh, my address properly. And what I want to do is I want to look a little bit behind us, a little bit, you know, looking to what happened to us in this past couple of months in, in the past year of the program, but I also want to look ahead. And looking, uh, looking to the past, um, going back to something that seems to be ages ago, the start of this calendar year. Uh, this year, 2020, is the year in which the UN exists for 75 years. And this, of course, was supposed to be a festive occasion. It was supposed to be a special year also for the program because we are uh, one of the partner universities and this is the United Nations University. And the program is built around the tasks of the UN and uh, around multilateralism in general. So this was a, a festive occasion that we were all looking forward to. Um, but then at some point things changed a little bit and uh, what happened, of course, is what you all know, the, the virus hit, we were locked down pretty quickly and the whole world changed. Now we've had a, a little while to reflect on what will happen to us in the, the world after the lockdown ends. We're slowly getting out of this lockdown and we are preparing for what happens then. But I don't think any one of us really knows at this stage what is going to happen uh, in that lockdown. We've been busy 
thinking about the future, but we've also been busy simply in trying to catch up with the present. And this is the situation that we've been in. We've been in online teaching for a while. I've been in one of the courses myself, meeting a select few students from the program. And you know that was actually quite a bit of adaptation and uh, needed a lot of our attention, a lot of our effort and a lot of our thinking. And overall, again, I think we've been doing pretty well. You know, the students here who are sitting in their laptop keyboards and so on, they've been doing pretty well. Uh, that's what I've been hearing from all the instructors. That's what I've been observing in the one course that I was involved in teaching myself. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that's actually very worthwhile mentioning and, and complimenting all of you, the students and the teachers on. But we also have to think about what will happen after this. And of course, for the students, the thing that comes immediately after the program is a summer. And in the past, summers used to look like this, at least for some people, you know, festivals, all kinds of things you could really get into it and you could be really having a good time, enjoying yourself, uh, having a great party uh, and looking at music in this particular way. But that has changed and I think it is going to change. It's going to be different for a little while uh, to come because the reality of festivals that we have been observing the past couple of months is this. And you might not recognize these people, but they're a bunch of old rockers, the Rolling Stones, and they gave an online Zoom concert where they played from different locations. And I've seen on my social media a great deal of people who were terribly excited about that. They thought it was fantastic, but not, a man, not many of those people were young people. So I think students and young people in general are looking to have something different than this online Zoom kind of, uh, of society that we have created so quickly. What young people, of course, want to do, maybe I'm stereotyping here a little bit, but let me indulge on, on that uh, for a moment. What young people, of course, want to do is they want to travel the world. They want to see the world. They are dynamic. They treat the world as a village, and the world is truly their place to study and is truly their place of work. And our program, the MPP program, is certainly a part of that. We attract uh, students from various locations all over the world and we pride ourselves for that. And we pride ourselves for sending our alumni all over the world to try and make a difference. And that's something that actually might become very difficult in the period after the Corona or COVID-19 crisis. So the world in terms of travel might look a little bit more like this. I'm sure we will still be flying, but it might be flying for a select happy few. Empty planes, except for a few people who can afford to fly in these big empty planes and who are allowed to cross the borders that, we, uh, that we've set. So it might actually be a completely different world. That's what most of us are expecting. And it will be a challenge for you students, alumni, to travel in that world and to navigate in that world. Now, of course, um, you may think that, you know, I'm one of these old people who might still enjoy the Rolling Stones on, on Zoom. Um, but is it really all doom and gloom the way that I'm talking about it now? Um, I actually don't think that it has to be. Things are looking pretty grim for a great deal of people across the globe. Poverty is rising, economic crisis, which is having all kinds of indirect effects also in terms of health. And generally, there are a lot of reasons to worry about the immediate future. But I would like to encourage you, our generation of alumni and students, to leave that doom and gloom picture behind you and think about what you have learned in our program uh, and how you can use that to make a better world even in the post-corona era. And if I were to summarize in a few words, what is the thing that you've learned or should have learned in this program, 
then I would say that it is that multilateralism, so international cooperation between countries in all kinds of forums and organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union, and like all kinds of other organizations that encourage international cooperation is the way to go forward for us. And we need you, the young generation, to make this happen. Because if we go back to the beginning of the lockdown, for many of us, it looked like this. You know, in Maastricht, we are very close to both Belgium and Germany. And before, if you wanted to go there, you wouldn't even notice, you know, you would cycle on a road and suddenly you would be in Belgium. Now you would meet these kinds of obstacles because the immediate gut reaction by a lot of our, uh, of, of our governments, local as well as national, was to close the borders. So rather than going and treat and, and you know, attack this crisis in a multilateral way, they were doing it each from their own national interests and their own national policies. You can also see that uh, at a not so local level when we saw the, uh, the polemics between the government of the US uh, as well as a few other governments and the World Health Organization, part of the UN, and of course a primary responsible uh, policy organization in times like these. And rather than joining in this organization, we've seen uh, a confrontation in these organizations and countries going at it alone rather than together. Now, at the same time, I think there are also a couple of good examples of how <laughs> might help you. This is a German chopper uh, who is actually picking up a Dutch corona patient. The Dutch hospitals were not well enough prepared. They couldn't handle or were very near to not being handling, being able to handle the stream of patients coming into their intensive care units. And then the Germans actually came in and they said, we have some space, please send us some of your patients. And this is one of these patients being transported to a German intensive care uh, unit. And I think that's a prime example of how in a multi-country way, in a multilateral way, we can attack these, uh, these, uh, these crises. And that's the way that we certainly need to go. So let me round up and let me go back to our own building. And this is the building. I imagine that this is what it must look like today because at least where I'm sitting, we have a little bit of sun and it's a beautiful light that we have on this, uh, on our building here. And that's how I would like you students and alumni to remember this building. I would like you to remember it as a place where you were given the central message that if we want to make this a better world in the post-corona era, then we must do this by doing it together as nations together as one world rather than as nations against each other. And if that is what you've learned as the central message, along, of course, with a whole lot of very specific baggage on the courses and the topics that you've studied here in this building, then I'm very happy. And I hope that in a couple of years from now, we will be able to see the fruits of that uh, in a future closing ceremony where one of you will be telling us how you dealt with that situation immediately after the uh, corona crisis. So let me stop there and wish you uh, all the best in your future careers. Let me already congratulate you on the closing of this academic, uh, of this academic year. And of course, also congratulations to your family and your friends. Thank you, Bart, very much for such a reflective uh, speech. Now, we invite you to join us to recognize all students who participated in the courses during this academic year. All of you have to continue working on your thesis, but today we can already celebrate the completion of courses. 
For this purpose, students have received a stall and a picture made by a local artist, and we hope that these two elements remind you of your MPP experience. We will recognize students for specialization. Specialization coordinators will take the floor, introduce the specialization, and students from the specializations are asked to turn on their cameras. For those who are in the YouTube channel, please feel free to join us with clapping. Even when students will not hear you, they will certainly receive the vibe and positive energy. This movement will be like a relay race, where we will pass the baton from one specialization to the other. So, on your mark, get set, go. We will start with students from foreign policy and development and with Dr. Hampton Pui Hang as specialization coordinator. I think uh, whoever takes the foreign policy and development specialization must be an adventurer. Our journey started in the Middle East you negotiated how the 1,000 mile long Abraham path should look like. You settled a chocolate trade war between Ecuador and Belgium. In the meantime, the COVID-19 crisis was worsening. Before the vaccine is developed, you discuss patent protection for vaccine. Finally, in the human rights course, you were once again tortured by Stata when we met the humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of the Congo tracing the footprints of peacekeepers in the Congo and Kosovo. During these four months, you have faced lots of challenges, economic models, state WTO law, the trips, political violence. Besides courage, you become more versatile and adaptable. I hope these qualities will walk you through your future adventure. We will now continue. Thanks. We will now continue recognizing the students who chose for a free elective track. The students that selected the free elective track decided for a combination of courses of two different specializations. They are the ones that followed a tailor-made recipe in view of their interests. Now I give the floor to Governance of Innovation, Specialization Coordinators, Professor Robin Cohen and Dr. Fabiana Vicentin, and be represented by Fabiana. Good afternoon, everyone. So this was the first year for our specialization with all new courses and almost all new teachers, many of whom had never taught in the MPP. So we faced a double challenge. All this novelty, designing and organizing the courses and learning the MPP rules plus the virus. But you did a, a great job. You did really well in uh, switching to the online teaching uh, with, uh, which happened over a weekend in the middle of a course. Technology for sure help, but you as human added creativity to manage the difficult moment. That was in the spirit of our specialization, governance of innovation. You gave us really helpful feedback about how to improve our learning from course to course. And as teachers, we are very impressed with your engagement with the subject and the quality of your work. So thank you, thank you very, very much for your hard work and really hearty congratulations on your uh, performance so far. Thank you guys. We now continue with the students from the Migration Specialization, Specialization Coordinator, Professor Melissa Siegel. Hello everyone and good afternoon. Well, it's been an interesting year to say the least. 
I have to say that it's absolutely been a pleasure having you in class and also meeting with you regularly virtually. COVID-19 has affected all of you in a variety of ways. And some of you even had to deal with contracting COVID-19 and dealing with being sick while studying. I know for others of you, it also meant having to follow courses from other countries, and it meant also perhaps even some financial burdens. But you were all extremely understanding, gracious, and motivated to, have, to, to, to still have a positive learning experience, and I really appreciated that from all of you. You even had to deal with one brand new course within the specialization. Not only was this the first year that it was offered, but we also had to put it online directly. And you really gave us important feedback in that process and were very helpful along the way. I do want to wish all of you congratulations on finishing the migration specialization in these very special times. I wish all of you a very bright future and I know that you have the tools in your bag for that future, especially with the job prep that we just had and finished and you all did very well with. And I hope to be able to see you face to face again in the not too distant future. Again, congratulations. We now continue with regional integration and multi-level governance Specialization coordinators, Dr. Mikhail Natorsky and Dr. Tatiana Skripka, and the cohort will be approached by Mikhail Natorsky. Okay, thank you, Julieta. I hope everybody hears me. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start with a quite obvious statement in current COVID-19 circumstances that contemporary challenges are transnational and global. They require close disciplinary policy solutions across state borders, and they should be based on professional policy analysis. And our specialization of regional integration and multi-level governance is designed to train students how to address this today obvious necessity. We focus on key social, political, and economic issues, such as sustainable development or conflicts across global, regional, and local levels. It is our ambition that after this specialization, you are able to take account of socially relevant problems in different regions by connecting rigorous policy analysis with actionable policy recommendations. And I am pretty convinced that we managed to accomplish this goal even this crazy year. And this specialization is made of all people involved and all of them they deserve special recognition. So that's first of all, Chibuye, Hannah, Romar, Hashem, Risa, Justine, Ravi, Cedric, Mai, Alessio, Jorge, and Lisa. Congratulations for the finishing the specialization. Your continuous commitment convinced me that we were not teaching holograms on our screens. So well done. Secondly, also my special gratitude and recognition to Maisha Fyrus, who took care of coordinating two courses of this specialization in these very challenging times. So big thank you for your extraordinary dedication and professionalism. And also, I would like to mention Godsway Tetech and Victor Osei, as well as our contributors from UN Ukris and all Ghost lectures from many locations, even from Chile this year. Thank you for your involvement in the courses and sharing your expertise with us. All of you made an enormous, enormous effort to preserve the essence of this specialization in these crazy times. I would like to wish all of you all the best and thank you for your commitment and good luck for the future. Thank you. We now give the floor to the specialization on risk and vulnerability, specialization coordinators, Professor Eleonora Nielsen and Dr. Valerie Grau, and the group will be approached by Lonica. Good afternoon, everybody. Dear risk and vulnerability students, in January, you went on a journey not without its own risk. We did a major overhaul of the specialization with new contents, a more stimulating group assignments compared to previous years. And we had to see just how that would work out. The start of the possibly most challenging assignment coincided with the transition from in-house to online teaching. 
due to COVID-19. And there you were, literally left on your own devices, your computer, and a sometimes not so stable internet connection. Exploring fresh grounds in statistics and GIS that were new to many of you, with limited helplines and sometimes challenging group dynamics. And how proud and happy Valerie and I were to see how you managed and flourished and even enjoyed it. This was great promise for you for your future as scholars, employees, friends, and global citizens. We wish you all the best. Well done. We now continue with a specialization on social entrepreneurship and public policy. Specialization coordinators, Professor Shama Ramani, Dr. Serda Tarkli, and Dr. Nordin Esaki. The cohort, the group will be approached by Shyama. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Julieta. The social entrepreneurship and public policy uh, was a new track created at the last minute to respond to the recognition that today's youth want to be part of the change to address problems not effectively solved by the market or public policy. So this new tract aimed to teach and train students to apply the principles of entrepreneurship to create multiple values, social, environmental, and economic. And this is exactly what our students did. They helped social entrepreneurs, they blogged, they advocated, they even created a social innovation. So we, all the three coordinators, are very proud of all of you and wish you very well. And we are also very happy that this batch has already created and launched a new social entrepreneur who has won a grant from his country. Thank you. We will now recognize our last specialization, social protection policy, specialization coordinator, Professor Francisca Gassman. Dear students, the last few months have impressively demonstrated the importance of social protection policies. For those of us living in rich European countries, social protection was a given, something we don't really notice or think much about. If this crisis has shown one thing, then it is the fact that social protection policies are absolutely essential in times like this to prevent the loss of livelihoods and protect people's living standards. I'm very proud of you. The four months of the specialization are challenging in normal times, but you had to deal with the sudden switch to an online setting. Your continuous attendance in online lectures and tutorials was impressive and it motivated us as teachers as well. So thank you so much. Now, we have high expectations for you. You have shown your, your resilience and stamina, your flexibility and adaptability. You are critical thinkers and you are not afraid of standing up for yourself and others, which shows your humanity. All these are competencies which are highly valued in the labor market. And I know we will hear a lot from you in the years to come. I'm sad to let you go. Sad that we did not have a chance to celebrate together in person. Sad that our online encounters are over. But in the end, it is the joy which prevails, knowing that we gave you as much as possible and that you will succeed. So please continue making the world a little bit better place. Goodbye and take care.
Thank you. It's so nice to see everyone uh, again. Uh, now, our um, what we call the MPP team, uh, who are following the the closing ceremony through the YouTube channel, they also wanted to participate and to say uh, somehow goodbye and good luck, and they prepared a video for the cohort. So, I will ask Dennis if you can play the video for the students. students, you did it. Congratulations. What a year we had. This year, we as Student Affairs started a new project and we called it Make Students Feel at Home. Unfortunately, it turned out to be Make Students Stay at Home. This was, of course, not what we planned it, but you adapted to it and you made it. You did a great job. Please stay healthy, stay strong, Goodbye and good luck. Dear students, at the end of this crazy year, I would like to say goodbye, good luck, stay safe and stay in touch. We would really, really like to know how you're doing. Dear MPB students, I do hope that life gives you everything you need to fulfill yourselves. I wish you all the best and I look forward to staying in touch. Congratulations, everyone, for a completed year of classes. We really enjoyed walking through it with you. All the best in the year to come. Thank you for being part of the MPP program and wishing you good luck. Bye. Dear students, I'm proud of all of you. Be the best version of yourself. Good luck and goodbye. Hi hi. Congratulations to you all and I wish you good luck with your future plans. Dear students, you did it. Congratulations. We won't forget you. Let's stay in touch. Dear students, congratulations. Good luck and stay in touch. Thank you. I'm sure many of you missed that coffee corner. Um, so with this, I will be closing the, the, closing, the, the closing ceremony, closing, closing of the Master of Science in Public Policy and Human Development cohort 2019-2020. Before coming to an end, I will ask if everyone can turn on their cameras, since it will be nice to see everyone again in this event. I will want to thank Denise for your technical support. Um, thanks a lot, you, you made it possible actually. And also I want to thank the team that organized this event Abby, Bo, Denise, Danny, Ingrid, and Rasma. You have done a fantastic job, so thanks for your support on this. Our aim today was that this closing ceremony would leave us with a feeling of hope for a bright future. That this closing ceremony would leave us with a quota of energy to make this bright future manifest. We continue our work, but today we celebrate this opportunity of being together. We know we can adapt to change, and above all, we are grateful. Let us stay connected, enjoy, and celebrate this achievement. Thank you very much, and again, it's wonderful seeing you. I'm <laughs> <laughs>